Hi, this is National Magister Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. This is going to be one of those videos that's a little bit more like a podcast, so if you're looking for a lot of action on the chessboard, I suggest you search on my channel for anything with a lot of action, analysis, evaluation, famous games, think out loud, that kind of stuff. Today we're going to talk about something that several people have asked me to make into a video, and it's an article I wrote many years ago about one of my most curious students, and his handle on the Internet Chess Club was Mr. Bojangles, and the article I wrote about him was called The Curious Case of Mr. Bojangles, and they asked me to make it into a video, so here we go. All right, so most adult improvers are trying to improve really strongly, but it takes a while. You know, chess is a complex subject, and it's not that easy to get better. It's usually a slow kind of thing. Now, one of the truisms is the, the lower your rating, the more you can improve in a short period of time. For instance, if your rating's like 400 because you just learned how to play yesterday, it's a lot easier to gain 500 points than if your rating is like mine at 2200 and you think maybe in a couple of weeks I could be as good as Magnus Carlsen. Doesn't work that way. So the the more you go up, the more each 100 points becomes difficult. So for instance, if someone comes to me and says, I want to gain 200 rating points and the rating's 800, I go, sure, no problem. Stick with me for a little bit and do the kind of things we talk about for the big three, time management and making safe moves and seeing if your opponent's move is safe and activ activate your pieces. We should be able to get you those 200 points. But the higher someone goes up, the harder that is. If someone comes to me and says, I'm 1,700, I want to be 1,900, well, you know, that's going to take a lot more work. So as you go up the ladder, it becomes more and more difficult. So it's relatively rare for, you know, my adult students who don't have as much time as youngsters to gain a lot of rating points, at least in a short period of time. But one of the exceptions was Mr. Bojangles. Now, on the ICC... Ratings were about 150 points higher than they were in USCF standard ratings. So when I first started teaching Mr. Bojangles, his ICC slow rating was about 1450, which is about 1300 USCF. And in one year, of which I gave him lessons for about half a year, maybe every week, every other week for half a year, but in that one year where he did the stuff that we talked about, he gained 550 rating points, and he went from ICC 1450 to ICC 2000, which is about 1850 USCF. So if we do it by USCF, he went from uh, about, um, let's see, I said he was 1350, uh, sorry, 1450, sorry. So he went from like 1300 to 1850 USCF in one year. <clears throat> so people ask me, how did he do it? And I gave that a lot of thought. And, you know, obviously it takes a lot of work. You know, you got to play a lot. you got to play in tournaments. you got to go over your games with your opponents. you got to study tactics. you got to read game books. you got to do all those things. But a lot of people do all those things. They don't gain that many points at that level. They might go from, you know, 700 to 1,200, but they don't go from, like, 1,300 to 1,850 in a year. That's very rare. Most of Bojangles was, I think, 38 years old when I first started working with him. So I asked myself, what's different about Mr. Bojangles than some of my other students? And I've already said, you know, talent is involved and hard work and all that fun stuff. But one of the things that I, that I noticed about Mr. Bojangles was Mr. Bojangles was pretty much the best student I ever had for knowing how to be the only student in the class. Think about that for a second. When you grow up and you're going to school, there's always a lot of people in your class and, you know, you have a teacher and the teacher is teaching something and, you know, you can ask the teacher questions, but you have to be careful about what you're asking the teacher because people don't want you to monopolize the teacher if there's 30 kids in the class and you keep asking questions, the kids are going to get upset with you, the, the teacher is going to get upset with you and the teacher will say things to you like, why don't you come in after class or maybe we could take up that question later or Things like that. They're not going to, you know, disrupt the whole class for one person. But when you're taking individual lessons one-on-one, -on -one, all that goes away, that is, it goes away that you're disrupting the whole class. 
But what doesn't go away is your is your mentality that you used to be used to taking lessons or taking, you know, learning in school, and you're used to learning in a certain way, which is you take notes, you study your notes. A lot of my students come to me and they say, I would like to tape record, you know, record our lesson, and I'd like to go over it later. And I say to them, all right, well, I would prefer you don't, but if you want to, go ahead. But it, my students who don't record seem to do a little bit better because they're paying more attention and they're willing to have a conversation. This gets back to Mr. Bojangles. Mr. Bojangles would never, ever, ever want to tape a lesson. Mr. Bojangles would want to take that lesson and grab it by the throat and see if he could shake me and find out how much he could learn. <clears throat> so when I would talk to Mr. Bojangles and we would go over stuff, Mr. Bojangles would not let anything go by where I was going too slow, too fast, said something he didn't understand, said something he didn't agree with. Whatever it was, he was the only person in the class and I was working for him. Now he didn't do this in a mean way. He didn't say things like, you're going too fast, slow down, or he didn't say, I don't understand that, you know, uh, you know, say it again. He didn't, he didn't do stuff like that. What he did was he stopped me and had a conversation every time there was an issue that he didn't know 100% what I was talking about or didn't agree 100% with what I was talking about. So we would go over something and I would say, in this kind of position, you want to get your rooks to the seventh rank. And he would say, wait a second, what do you mean by in this type of position? What are the aspects of this type of position that make you say in this type of position? And why should I get my rooks to the seventh rank? You know, yes, I see on the seventh rank that they're a little more active than they are now, but what, what makes you say that in this position you want to go to the seventh rank? Explain it to me. Make sure that I understand it. Or if I said, okay, uh, in here I think the Benoni jump is a good idea, he would say, why haven't I never heard of the Benoni jump when I read about this from other grandmasters? And where did you get that information? And why, why should I call it the Benoni jump? And, uh, you know, how would I remember this? And what, what aspect of the position? He would start a discussion about anything he thought that he didn't completely understand or that he disagreed with me. If I said something and he said, oh, but I read in some book that some grandmaster said that that's not true. Why do, why do you say that it is true? And, you know, what would you say if the grandmaster said to you that you were wrong? that kind of stuff, he would, he would start discussions that way. So let me give you an example since we, we don't want to completely do a podcast here. Let's say that I teach people that if you play e4 and they play e5, and at some point in the game if you play d4 and they defend with d6, that it's generally incorrect to play d takes e, d takes e. Now you might argue, oh, but in this position you could trade queens and you can't castle. Yeah, 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 we're not talking about this position. We're talking about this pawn structure. I don't want to take all the pieces off the board. That'll just take some time. But I'm just saying in this pawn structure in general, everything else being equal, white doesn't want to take there. Why? Because in this position right now, white has a space advantage with e4 and d4, and black has less space with e5 and d6. And therefore, white can have more space. He can use both squares here while black can't on the third rank. And this bishop's going to be blocked. And this neither bishop for white is going to be blocked. And as soon as white trades over here and we reach this kind of pawn structure, then it's been completely symmetric and white no longer has a space advantage. And therefore, in general, it has nothing to do with trading queens or anything else. Just in terms of pawn structure, it's better to have the pawns like this than it is to have the pawns traded. Now that doesn't mean there's not individual positions, like maybe here if you want to trade queens and go into the end game, okay. But if we're just talking pawn structure, this pawn structure for white is somewhat better than the pawn structure if we trade. All right, now let's actually play a game where we could try to go against it, where Mr. Bojangles might question that. So let's say white plays knight f3 and black plays the Philidor defense. And white plays the main move, which is d4. And here is where Mr. Bojangles might say to me, why d4? Why not get your bishop out and try to castle? You know, I was taught to get, you told me to get move every piece once before you move any piece twice. And you taught me to castle as soon as possible. Why should I waste time playing d4 when I could get my bishop out and I could castle, blah, 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 and start a big discussion about that. 
but he wanted to pick my brain. He wanted to make sure he understood. That's what he was trying to do. He wasn't trying to be argumentative, although I'm sure some people would view it that way. He wasn't arguing with me. He wanted me to explain everything to his satisfaction. Okay, so d4, and now let's say black plays knight d7, which is the main move, and now white plays bishop to c4, and now let's make some bad moves for black. Let's say black plays is worried that if he plays knight f6, white's going to play knight g5. Now the best way to beat that, which I said in earlier videos, is just simply develop the bishop first. Now he can't play knight to g5 because you just take it. And if white castles, and then you play knight f6, and then he plays knight g5, well then you could just castle. I see lower rated players do this wrong all the time, and they get burned by knight g5 after knight f6, and instead of playing bishop e7 here, they play a silly move like h6, just completely wasting time. All right, and let's say white now plays um, knight c3, and black plays a6. All right, so I might say to Mr. Bojangles, all right, I think here you should take the pawn. And Mr. Bojangles is going to say, but Dan, you've already taught me in this pawn structure that it's incorrect to take that pawn. I don't see a tactic here. Why would I want to take the pawn here when the principle is that in this pawn structure, you generally don't want to take the pawn? And I would say something like, okay, well, it's right in general, but now we have to deal with the specific position. And black has wasted all that time playing a6 and h6, and you want to punish that. And you want to punish it by opening up the game so your better development can take place. And here, if you play pawn takes pawn, even though if he plays pawn takes pawn, you can't win the pawn with knight takes e5, you can start to think about things like queen to d5 and queen to, and bishop takes f7 check and all those kind of tactics, which opening up the position will give to you that you can't get if you keep it closed. For instance, probably the worst positional move on the board here that you could play is d5. And then maybe Mr. Bojangles would say, well, that's the kind of move that I might play because I want to gain space and gaining space is good. Why is gaining space bad here? And then I would say, okay, well, gaining space here, you're not gaining much space, but what you are doing is you're blocking your bishop, you're blocking your knight, and you're blocking your queen, and you're blocking the whole center where all your pieces are. And now the fact that black has played a6 and h6 is almost justified because he's the one getting space on the wings where all the action's going to be. And meanwhile, white's just wasting time in the center, blocking it all up, so his pieces can't get through. So d5 is a terrible, terrible move. And then Mr. Bojangas would say, is there any way like you can prove that? And I would say, okay, well, sure, let's turn on the engine. So let's go here. Right now, Stockfish says if I take the pawn, which is what I said, that I'm up 4.5 pawns, which is enough to win the game. But let's see what happens when I play d5. 4.5, d5. I'm down to 0 0.4. So I am four pawns worse than I would have if I played the best move by blocking all my pieces like that. Let's look at what happens here if I play the right move, pawn takes pawn. Now notice the engine says that black cannot recapture because, well, we'll show you why, but, it, but his best three moves are not recapturing. So let's try to recapture and show why. Let's say he takes with the pawn. So now I have the famous tactic, bishop takes f7 check. If he doesn't want to not be able to castle and not move the king and everything else, he may as well take it. And now I can play knight takes e5 check. He can't take me with his knight because his knight's pinned. But now his white squares have been weakened by the h6 move. So if he tries to go back king to e8, I'm going to start a checkmate sequence with check here, check here, check. It's always good to play these out and learn the patterns. Here, bishop check. And if he goes over here, we've got a checkmate. Something like that. All right, what if he doesn't go to e8? Suppose he comes up to f6. All right, well, here we go. Knight d5 check. Let's say he takes the knight. I play bishop f4 check. He tries to come back here. I play check. Stockfish says he should give up the queen, but of course humans aren't going to do that, so let's keep trying to run. King to e7, queen to d6 check, king to f7, queen to e6 checkmate. And we could keep going through lines like this. This is like my video that went viral a week or so ago, which is, you know, play what-if games with the computer. 
You know, what if he does this? What if he does that? What if he does this? So it turns out he can't, if he takes with the pawn, bishop f7, check wins. What if he takes with the knight? Well, but then I could start out knight takes, pawn takes. And here I could win a pawn with queen takes, king takes, bishop takes, f7, and stop him from castling. But way better is to do it the opposite way. Anytime you see that ABC works, you might ask yourself, does CBA work even better? So if, a, if this is A, B, C, then we should re reverse the order and play C first. And now he can't take the bishop because he loses his queen, so he has to play king to E7. And now the engine says, oh, his king's stuck in the middle. Let's not trade queens. Queen F3, knight F6, bishop G6, bishop E6 castle, bishop f7, rook d1 hitting the queen. If he tries to save the queen, we've got knight d5 check, knight takes d5, rook takes, if he takes my rook, I take his queen. Let's say he takes me here, then rook checks, king d8, thank you for the queen anyway, and so on. Okay, so we're pretty much showing now through some of these lines. Are these easy lines? No, of course not. That after a6, that we should play pawn takes pawn. Notice this position is not in the master's database because no masters are going to play h6 and a6 like beginners do here, getting all worried. Oh, I, I, don't, I wanted to stop his knight from going to g5. Oh, I wanted to stop him from... from checking me. Oh, I wanted to stop his knight from coming up here and threatening to fork me. Oh, I, I had to play those h6a6 moves every, every game to stop him from doing stuff. Okay, so so here, and I, you know, maybe Mr. Bojangles and I would have a, a long talk about, you know, play, when, when, can, when can you play ace? He says, you had me read logical chess move by move, and Irving Chernev says not to do that, but I heard that Grandmaster John Nunn thinks that Irving Chernev is full of baloney, and that a lot of times those h3, a3 moves are really good. And I would say to Mr. Bojangles, okay, well, can you read my novice nook uh, guide to pawn to rook three? These days I would say watch the video on YouTube here, guide to pawn to rook three. And then next week we'll talk about it. And then he would say, sure. And then next week he would come back and say, I watched your novice nook on h3, a3, and I made some notes. And I have three questions about your, about your video or your novice nook. And you say in this and this and this position that h3 is sometimes good, sometimes bad. I don't quite understand when it's good and when it's bad. See if you can explain that to me. And so on and so on. So he would just keep pumping me for information. And as I said, he would never let me leave things where he wasn't satisfied. He was always pumping me until he was satisfied that I was, you know, the teacher. I was the only teacher in the class. He was the only student in the class. It was like he wasn't worried that he was taking me down a bad path. It, you know, if, if he trusted me that if he was taking me down a bad path, I would stop him and say, that's above your like, pay grade or, you know, let's do things in the right order. But I rarely did that. Normally he had a pretty good idea of what he could understand and what he didn't. So if he said, yes, yes, I'd like to go through the rest of the game, but even more important is to understand in this position, you know, when I'm supposed to do this and when I'm supposed to do that, because there's, this game is very unique, but what you're telling me is very generic. So I want to really understand, you know, what's going on with regard to that. And he would just keep forcing me to do that. So as I said, Mr. Bojangles was not shy about being the only person in the class. So when people ask me, what was special about Mr. Bojangles? Did he have some talent? Sure. Did he work hard? Sure. Did he play a lot of games? Sure. Did he do his homework? Sure. He did all those things. But he was very good about being the only student in the class. He would, he would make sure he was using the teacher to help him the best he can. Because I start every lesson by asking my students, do you have any questions or anything special you'd like to do today? And one of the things I tell my students they can do is find a position from one of your games where you didn't know what to do, or a puzzle where you couldn't solve it, or a grandmaster game where the grandmaster made the wrong move, or something like that. And when you come to the lesson and I say, do you have any questions or anything special you want to do today? Throw a puzzle up at me, throw the position up at me, but don't tell me anything about it. Don't tell me this is a game I played and I didn't know what to do. Don't tell me this is a game I played and I missed a tactic here. Don't tell me this is a puzzle, white to play and mate in four. Don't tell me this is Grandmaster so-and-so's game and he played a beautiful combination. Don't tell me any of those things. Just say white to play, Dan, 
think out loud for me and let me figure out, let me pick your brain on that. Did Mr. Bojangles do that all the time? No, but in essence, that's very similar to the kind of things that he would do. You know, pick my brain, pick my brain, keep picking my brain, make sure my lesson is oriented toward exactly his understanding of what I'm trying to teach him. It wasn't that he would say at the start of the lesson, today we're gonna go over how to mate with a king and two bishops against the king. He never did that. You know, he, would, he had a lot of questions, but a lot of them were as part of puzzles, as part of the games he played, as part of what I wanted to try to teach him. But he wanted to make sure he was absorbing it to the, his ultimate extent, and he wanted to get the most of it he could during the lesson, as opposed to, let's say, as I said, maybe, you know, uh, taping, the, taping the lesson and then trying to play it back, back later. It's much, much, much better to have a conversation and to have it keep going back and forth and back and forth and just listen to someone like you're listening to me now. It would be better if this was, you know, an interactive, uh, you know, stream rather than, it's, than a video like this. And, of course, I have, I've done a little streams with Laura right recently on Twitch, and I hope to do some more. But yeah, and I have group lessons sometimes. I'm gonna see a group this Sunday. If you have a group that wants to have a group lesson, you can get your group together and then you can contact me through my website and say I have a bunch of people that like to do that and we can all talk to you. Or of course, individual lessons has been my main job. All right, so I'm gonna leave you with a, with a final story about Mr. Bojangles. So I told you at the start that his first rating was ICC 1450, which is about USCF 1300. And I told you that at the end, his ICC rating hit 2000. And that was after one year. And he only took lessons for about the first six months. And then he, he did the stuff that I was still telling him. But at that point, he, he had stopped taking the lessons. But he continued to improve through the year. And he continued to keep in touch with me. And at the end of the year, we were having a conversation about how well he had done. And I was amazed. And I was telling him, wow, you've really done well. And you really, you know, got good things. And Mr. Bojangles said to me, you know, Dan, there's something I want to tell you. And I said, okay. And in my mind, I'm thinking, hmm, uh oh, what's this going to be? So he says, do you know when we first started taking lessons, he said, I would fight you tooth and nail over every little point. And I said, well, yeah, okay. And he says, I want to tell you something. He says, now that I'm much better, I think back on it. And when he got to that point in the sentence, when he says, now that I'm a better player, I think back on it. And I was quickly in my mind going through, what, how is he going to finish this sentence? And the thing I kept thinking he was going to say, I shouldn't say kept thinking because it only happened in a second or two. The thing I thought he was going to say was, you know, you were right. It, it, a lot of those things were good, but a couple of those things... Turns out it's a lot more complicated than what you said, or maybe you would have done it this way, it would have been better, or maybe I would have learned faster if you had done this. That's what I thought he was going to say. But Mr. Bojangles surprised the heck out of me. He said, Dan, you know how I used to fight you tooth and nail over every little thing when I started? And I said, yes. And he said, well, now that I'm a much better player, I've thought back on it. And he said, you are right about everything. <laughs> and I almost fell off my chair. That <laughs> was the last thing in the world that I expected Mr. Bojangles would tell me. So when I wrote the novice nook, that's how I ended the novice nook with the line, you were right about everything. And boy, was I surprised. So I never expect to be right about everything, especially when you spend all those hours working with someone. But it was very nice of him to say so. All right, so that is it. That's the curious case of Mr. Bojangles. Hopefully you learned a little bit in this video and hope you'll tell people about my channel, Dan Heisman Chess. You can subscribe, you can like the, the video, but the best thing you can do is, you know, tell all your chess friends about my YouTube channel. My website is danheisman.com. My chess tip of the day on Twitter is, you know, twitter.com slash danheisman. So if you haven't followed me on Twitter, you can do that too. I appreciate all of it. I'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.